four years ago, I made the first presentation on a uh, modeling tool. I think I see some of those faces. So at that time, I was an assistant professor of civil engineering at Florida International University. And four years later, uh, I moved up one step, <laughs> uh, associate professor of civil engineering, and tenured. It makes a difference, <laughs> big difference. <laughs> so, and, and I also moved from the sea level to the mountain. So now let's come back to the sea level. I have been working with this stuff from the beginning, uh, like uh, it's one team uh, since 2011. And we, I, I think the first proposal we wrote, yes, in 2011, summer. And so it has been nine years. So this is the second step, as Jim Rasman said. Uh, I'm sorry to bring you from the lunch. It was fun. It was fun for me, too. So I was thinking, oh, I have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the title. And uh, I would not apologize, but I will give disclaimer. There will be a little bit of mathematical equations. Just bear with me. You don't have to go all of it, throw all of it. Uh, at the end, we'll give you an Excel spreadsheet, and then Mohammed will work, 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 walk you through that Excel spreadsheet. So a generalized model of greenhouse gas fluxes in coastal salt marshes across New England and the mid-Atlantic region of USA. So before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the funding agency. Of course, this project is funded by NOAA NARS. And uh, I have gotten along the way to NSF grants uh, to supplement uh, this work and along with others. Uh, and I would like to thank my collaborators because we had what we call tier one and tier two data. Tier one data was mainly collected by ourselves uh, in the New England region. Uh, Jim Tang, Kevin Kroger, Megan, and many other people. Uh, you know, forgive me if I do not mention all of you. At the end, I will try to. So, and then tier two data, we have collected it from our collaborators uh, across the mid-Atlantic region. So we have, uh, you know, Ken Zapata, Beth Watson, Beth Watson and uh, Pat McGonigal, Tom Mosder. Uh, if I, I, I will see if I have missed anybody, but Kevin, I don't think I have missed anyone. So, so that basically gave us 26 sites, including ours. Uh, 26 sites uh, to compare our modeling, testing, developing, and retesting again, and finalize our model. Okay, so, but again, uh, this is still, I still consider, although the first version of the model is published, the generalized uh, portion of the model, I still consider it in testing phase because we put it uh, in Excel spreadsheet and we have coded in Visual Basic and uh, there has to be back testing. So we are still in that phase. So I would give that uh, disclaimer. So with that, I'll go forward. Uh, a, a little bit of background. Um, do I need to say tidal wetland play a critical role in soil atmospheric exchanges of greenhouse gases? Uh, of carbon dioxide and methane, nitrous oxide in our measurements, there were trace amounts. So we, we, we did not uh, focus further. So we mainly focused on carbon dioxide and methane. So why does it matter? Because a delicate balance in the environmental drivers such as climate, hydrology, sea level, land uses, determine wetlands as the net source and sink of greenhouse gas fluxes. This is just an overview you can consider from the morning presentation. Basically, I saw these messages. And a generalized model is needed to predict wetland greenhouse gas fluxes and potential carbon storage. I call it potential because we did not code in lateral fluxes uh, uh, in, the, in the Excel spreadsheet. So the model can facilitate why is the model necessary because it can facilitate management of carbon, potential carbon stock, I would say. Potential means maximum uh, in tidal wetlands and their incorporation into a carbon market. 
uh, under different climate sea level rise and restoration scenarios. I mentioned restoration here, but with some caveats because our data did not include uh, tidally restricted uh, wetlands re really. So these are mainly salt marshes as you will see in our model development. So this is our aspiration that we want to do respiration scenario, test respiration scenarios like from freshwater to you know brackish to mesohaline, polyhaline, euhaline salt marshes, what can happen with restoration. So this is kind of our, as I say, as we, as we move forward, we made some progress, we have to make more progress. All right, so let's go directly to this model. What did we name this model? In the Journal of Geophysical Research, uh, Biogeosciences paper that uh, Ariana showed in the morning, we presented CWGM 2.1, actually 1.0. 1.0, coastal wetland greenhouse gas model. So this is what I consider coastal wetland greenhouse uh, gas model 2.0, and hopefully there will be more. So as we get more data, expand our domain, so we, we keep upgrading the model version. So this is basically a parallel scaling based empirical model. Again, it's empirical model developed by using data for 26 tidal wetlands. Uh, along the mid-Atlantic coast of USA. And uh, our main focus was that previously our model was Okayot Bay model, okay? So we wanted to increase the gradients, biogeochemical gradients, gradients in salinity, gradients in tidal ranges, gradients in temperature, gradients in even light, if, if, if there, there are any. So the model takes soil temperature, sorry, uh, light, which is photosynthetically active radiation, scientists know it. Uh, but uh, for uh, you know, non-scientists, this is basically sunlight and soil temperature and soil pore water salinity as inputs to predict carbon dioxide and methane fluxes. The model estimates the greenhouse gas fluxes. Uh, basically, it's an accounting. Once you predict, then you see what is the balance between uh, productivity minus net respiration, then uh, minus uh, what is the methane, emitted methane. So basically, you get a potential wetland carbon storage. The reason, once again, I say potential wetland carbon storage because lateral fluxes would also play a big role. So you have to subtract natural, lateral flux from potential to get the actual. So uh, by upscaling the predicted instantaneous fluxes, because we predict instantaneous fluxes, and then we, we scale it up to the extended growing season, and that's what we call annual uh, net atmospheric removal, carbon removal, NACR, in other words, potential wetland carbon storage. So this is basically the same thing. We are using different terms, but this is not net ecosystem carbon balance, okay? So the model is presented in a simple macro-enabled Excel spreadsheet. We did our modeling in MATLAB, did all this analysis, and eventually, when we found the uh, model parameters, uh, we, we basically coded it in, in Excel spreadsheet so that anyone can just put in their input data and run the model, and uh, it's basically a macro. So put on, uh, click on the macro, get the predicted carbon dioxide, methane, and potential carbon storage, okay? So, we, may, we call it user-friendly because you just need working knowledge of Excel spreadsheet to, to really use it. So, all right, for what was the objective of bringing relatively simple empirical model uh, to, to really Excel spreadsheet? The, the, once again, this is, this is uh, a product for coastal stakeholders, uh, land, land or reserve managers, restoration practitioners, different governmental agencies and NGOs who barely have time to go into the nuance of mathematics. So policy makers, so basically, you know, there may be other stakeholders, but basically these are the target groups we had in our mind when we started out. Uh, so model development, first the model development that we, we did in the past, and then further development with new data, and we wanted to see whether we have a generalized model for New England 
and beyond like mid, mid Atlantic coast of USA. Now, this is, <laughs> you don't have to read all of it. I am sorry for it, but I had to tell you how, basically to remind you how I came up with this idea. You know, last, last time around I gave a you know, relatively longer story, but this time I, let me just refresh the memory. I actually started uh, doing mechanistic modeling, means I was trying to describe the mathematical processes, I'm sorry, uh, biogeochemical processes with mathematics. Uh, for example, uh, I saw on speaker was describing how you know, microbial community can change with uh, nutrient uh, variation, right? Different nutrient in input. So I started out with those kind of modeling. You know, and one of those models was denitrification, de uh, decomposition uh, model, DNDC. Uh, professor uh, Changshan Lee from University of New Hampshire, research professor, he died in 2015, but he did one of a kind, you know, developed that kind of model for freshwater system, primarily started with agricultural system. So he wanted to predict greenhouse gas fluxes from croplands and then he expanded it to freshwater wetlands. So I started with that kind of modeling and I realized that that kind of modeling have hundreds of parameters. It's very difficult you know, to really get good prediction even at the site scale if you don't have sufficient data. And even if you fit it to a particular site, once you take it to another system, then again you, you've got to have all kind of data because that calibrated model would not be applicable even though it's mechanistically based, it has, it has many parameters. So parameters, you, you know, you need parameters in mechanistic model to fit the data. That's the, you know, I have done modeling for the last 15 years. So that's how, you know, it works. Even though you describe the mechanism, you still need parameters, a lot of them, because you have so many processes. So, so when I was working with that, I worked one year, I realized that, you know, that kind of modeling, even if you are successful at site scale, you know, can you really take it to the end users? And how easy is it to develop that model? And how easy is it to use it? Okay, so then I am I'm a civil engineer. I have done high engineering hydrology. So all my degrees are in civil and environmental engineering. So I thought that how about bringing the engineering concept? Like you don't look for like uh, Ariana and others are saying, you don't look for the perfect tool or perfect information. Engineering has been done for last 100 or 200 years with imperfect information. That whatever you have, you use mathematics to quantify that. Don't worry about uncertainty, have knowledge about it. So, and then design with the best information. Yes, it doesn't work and then people say, engineers are not smart people, dumb people. They don't know anything, what do they know? And what do I know? <laughs> so, so, you know, that kind of, you know, take that criticism, learn from that criticism, and then design for the next step. And that's how you build civilization. So, so that, I, I tried to bring that kind of, I don't know, 10 or 11 years of schooling. So, my bachelor's, master's, PhD, you count it. So, so I, I brought that understanding and said that, okay, I will take an empirical approach, but it's not just fitted. I am going to look for salient features in the data means this is complex process, many complex processes are interacting with each, with each other, but at the end, do I see an, an emerging pattern? Do I see a scaling law? Means does the fluxes, do the fluxes of carbon dioxide follow any scaling law temperature, soil temperature, or light, or salinity, or same about methane. If I can find those, how do I find those? And these are the steps that I used, uh, you know, to, to kind of you know, analyze the data, I should not say to death, but rigorously, okay? And then, then understand that what can I do? And eventually I realized that this is what I can do, okay? Before, before going there, I thought I, I, this, this is the product, that after doing that, I realized this simple, the, the model can be as simple as this, it's not perfect, it's probably one of the best that I know. You see what I'm saying? So that's how I thought. Okay, B before that, let's, let us give some refresher in terms of Okayot Bay model. This is CWGM 1.0. Okay, we had, you know, in the morning, uh, so many speakers went through this. 
I think at least one, two, or three. So we had, this is occurred by system. We had four sides with new nitrogen gradient. I mean, not a, a, not, not a huge nitrogen gradient to a moderate level of nitrogen gradient. And we collected these fluxes of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, air temperature, soil temperature, photosynthetically active radiation light, and soil temp moisture, water level, and then pore water salinity and pore water pH. And I analyzed this data using the previous framework and came up with this model. There are a lot more details. Let's forget about those. And please bear with me on this since I have some equations. You can see that this is net uptake, basically net ecosystem exchange of carbon dioxide. So this is the net uptake fluxes during the daytime you have this equation, which is light to the power 2 by 3 approximately, soil temperature to the power 3 and 3.33 uh, approximately, 3.28, and then soil salinity, pore water salinity of approximately 1. So you can see that net uh, carbon dioxide fluxes uptake, it is negatively related with salinity and uh, positively related with uh, uh, light and soil temperature. And this is daytime carbon dioxide uptake. And this is the nighttime or evening time net emission. And there's, you see that there is an exponent, scaling exponent of, of soil temperature is about 1.5, okay? Basically, uh, 3 by 2. And then we wanted to see how well does it predict. And we see that it, well, it predicts pretty well. We have done cross-validation 1,000 times. We did not just use one set of data. We split the data into 80, 20, and, and we, we, re, we repeated it many times, 1,000 times, to make sure that we have robust estimation. And you see that it predicts carbon dioxide pretty well. So this is about Okayot Bay, right? So then, you know, let me show you the methane emission. Carbon dioxide was in nano, nanomole. You see that, sorry, micromole per meter square per second. So it's pretty high. Then. If you compare it with methane, it's actually nanomole meter square per second. And by now we know that salt marshes has very relatively low methane emission, salt marshes. So this is a highly saline salt marsh. And you can see that we had a, a similar kind of emergent scaling law. And this is day and night time, same equation. You have soil salinity. And we proposed in this paper that it's actually you know, 4 by 3 minus four by three. So methane emission decreases in a, in a non-linear scaling with a scaling exponent of minus four by three. So, and then I did not propose it because I, I thought that this coefficient is probably 3.45 of soil temperature is kind of dependent on the, uh, on the data of Okayot Bay. So I did not propose that scaling equation. Instead, I said that this is in the scaling law. These are the equations, but we need to test more. So, but as I said, was, why are those, for example, are these only fitted to the data? I, I had, uh, you know, strong conviction that no, with salinity, since we have so much published data in literature, so we use those, and at different temperature, like 10 degree, 15 degree, 20 degree, 25, 30, 35 degrees Celsius, we, we basically plotted using following this equation, plotted the methane fluxes with increasing salinity. And we see that the published data across the world, and, you know, they are kind of uh, you know, falling within this range. Okay? So that gave me hope. And you can see that you have freshwater uh, marsh, marsh here, oligohaline, which is up to 5 ppt, mesohaline, which is 5 to 18 ppt, parts per thousand ppt means polyhaline, 18 greater than 18 parts per thousand. So that gave me hope actually that we can, we can likely, you know, since we are, I'm seeing some salient emergent scaling laws, it is likely that we would be successful, okay? But you cannot be, you know, sure until you test with the data. So that's what we did, okay? As I said, B, this is BWM2 for model generalization. And we kept the occurred Bay data as a participant. And then we have more data uh, from Jim Tang in Cape Cod Bay. So Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, Plum Island, 
Bar Barnegat Bay, and forgive me if, if I do not you know, pronounce them <laughs> correctly. So Delaware Bay, you know, New Jersey, Delaware Bay, Delaware, Fox Creek, Mar Maryland, and Freeman Creek, North Carolina. In, in the map, you can see that we have one site in North Carolina, and then you have Maryland, Chesapeake Bay, basically, and then we have Delaware, and then you have New Jersey, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Okay, so why different colors? Uh, basically, triangles are t tier one data, what we have measured, I'm sorry, uh, triangles are tier two, what came from other people, our collaborators. These are triangles, right? These are triangles, and this is triangle from Tom Mosder, and, and, and circles are our own data set. Now, why different color? Different colors are, you know, the green uh, square is Spartina alterniflora, and blue squares are Spartina patents. Actually, not squares, just, just this is a, a legend for colors. We are using different symbols for, to show tier one and tier two, but different colors to show different species. As you can see, Spartina alterniflora in green, and uh, blue is pe Spartana patterns, and red is distilis. Uh, can you can you help me to say? Okay, so she said it. <laughs> so, so so you can see that uh, you know, and there are some mixture. Okay, so we have mainly three species, and a mixture thereof. Okay, and uh, as you can see, these are. Our, basically salt marsh species. We, we don't see freshwater you know, species here. So what we are presenting today, and that's basically salt marsh, okay? The model is salt marsh model, okay? So, all right, so I just wanted to give you a feel about the range of the data. As you can see, uh, you know, this is carbon dioxide fluxes, this is methane fluxes, uh, and then light, soil temperature, salinity, and as you can see, temperature uh, ranges from 8.8 .8 to 36.2, and you have natural salt marsh, then you have restored salt marsh, this is both means overall summary, okay? And you see that there, you know, even carbon dioxide uptake, this is comparable, okay? And uh, as you can see, restor restored and natural, comparable, although restored has mo slightly more you know, productivity. And then uh, methane emission uh, from natural, it goes you know, pretty high eventually. You know, this is nanomole, okay? Not as high compared to carbon dioxide, but when you compare it with uh, restored uh, salt marsh, it has much less uh, methane emission, okay? This is based on the data. So, you, can, you are looking at around 3,900 versus 30. And then PAR is kind of, you know, these are comparable. And uh, soil temperature, I already told you. Salinity is like in the natural, the lowest salinity we had is 1.6. And But trust me, this is not the common thing, 1.6. This We have salinity mostly more than 10 ppt, okay? So 10 ppt to 50, up to 50 ppt. Now in restored, same thing, you know, 10 up to 27. So I just wanted to give you a feeling, okay, I understood, I can keep talking, I am a professor, read. So, <laughs> all right. So this is the, you know, uh, generalized model. And you can see the same model structure, right? PAR, salinity, as Okayot Bay, PAR, soil temperature, and salinity. Salinity has a you know, coefficient of approximately minus one, right? Soil temperature, previously it was 3.28. I, I, I told you that I was you know, kind of skeptical that that will not be generalized, but here we see 1.36, kind of close to 1.33. PAR is close to 0.66. It's 7.4, 0.66, and 7.4 is not too far, they are close. So, and, and for, this is for net emission, nightly or evening. Uh, carbon dioxide emission. You can see that previously we had 1.49, we have 1.58. So previously we hypothesized 
that the you know uh, respiration carbon dioxide respiration net respiration scales with temperature soil temperature with an exponent of 1.5 so we are not far apart we are close by so this is what the you know we have now 443 data point and this is how the you know observed versus predicted look like okay and this is one to one line this is not the model line one to one line just to show you that it falls on both sides of this line so it is kind of normally distributed the errors so that's what we look for in modeling and ns is you can say r square coefficient of determination so it is we are explaining 70% variance in the data okay so with the methane you can see that it's the same structure their night time salinity is uh, previously we found 1.35 now we get 1.31 the scaling law that I proposed was 4 by 3, which is 1 by 1, 1.33. So it holds, okay, with, with methane. Uh, and then soil temperature uh, is, uh, previously it was 3.45, it is now 4.54. I would believe this one more because we have more data. So in summary, our salinity, light exponent, scaling exponent, it was not really, you know, different. But soil temperature exponent for both carbon dioxide uptake and methane emission was different. However, it was not different for uh, carbon dioxide emission. So it was 1.5. So eventually, you know, I will go faster, as you can understand. So we can explain up to 80, 80 to 81% 80, 80, variance in the data. And we have oligohaline, mesohaline, polyhaline, and euhaline ranges. Okay. But oligohaline ranges, once again, I'll, I'll just, this is for methane, more true for methane uh, in the data. But for carbon dioxide, we did not get much oligohaline. We, we basically represented mesohaline, polyhaline, and euhaline. But for methane, we have all, all four ranges. That's just the availability of the data. Okay, so based on that, I already spoke with you. So I will, I'll cut this slide. So based on that, you know, my observed scaling laws, which I called in according to literature language like jargons, is these are organizing principles like many complex processes interacting together, eventually giving this kind of emergent properties. Okay? And that is carbon, carbon dioxide net uptake scales with PR with an exponent of 2 by 3, soil temperature, it scales with soil temperature with an exponent of 4 by 3, and salinity with an exponent of minus 1. And carbon dioxide emission, it scales with soil temperature with an exponent of 3 by 2. And methane emission, it scales with uh, soil temperature with an exponent of 9 by 2. And salinity, it scales with salinity with an exponent of 4 by 3. And this is just, you know, how PowerPoint will treat you. There is a minus here, okay? Minus 4 by 3, okay? So based on that, we, what we did, we just, we wanted, as I said, I just, did not want a fitted model. So, and, okay. So these are the exponent. These are our, based on our observation. So we fi uh, fixed the exponents and recalculated uh, the scale factor exponent. You know, that's what you want to do when you are doing scaling, okay. So we fix this based on our understanding of the data, and then we recalculated the scale factor exponent here, like 1.55 and then, 10 to the power A is basically A is different for different uh, salinity regime for methane. So this, these are our you know, proposed emergent generalized models now. I think you have not left me. That's good. So let me, let me move on to the actual model. That's the Excel, Excel spreadsheet where we coded it. Okay? You, have, you give light, one observation of light, one observation of soil temperature and pore water salinity. And then usually, you know, May to October is 183 days of growing season. It depends where you are, but in this region, New England and Mid-Atlantic, 183 is not a bad understand, I mean, assumption about growing season. And then you give, you know, uh, you give uh, global warming potential, okay? And there is a big debate about that. I'm not part of this debate. I just use it. Okay. So, so 
you can if you don't want to use global warming potential use one okay but uh, methane is more potent than carbon dioxide right so from literature we found 34 is 100 year global warming potential of uh, of uh, methane and uh, you can use 86 we give a drop down menu here you can choose one you can choose 34 you can choose 86 i will change it in the future if the community comes up with different numbers okay so then you just click on run and you will get predicted net uptake of carbon dioxide net emission of carbon dioxide net emission of methane and then we scale it up to the growing season means annual and then you get net atmospheric carbon removal which is the potential carbon storage in the soil given your data okay potential as i said because i know that you know some of my colleagues would not agree if i say it's actual because it's not actual there are lateral fluxes okay so this is the link that you want to go i know tona mary asked you to bring your laptop and I, all blames to her <laughs> if it doesn't work so so if you need help if you want to go there mohammed will help you you can raise your hand and he will he will go and all you need to go do go to this link of okayot bay reserve.org okay so before before we run the model i wanted to you know give you just an alert is like look at this if if i can get your attention these are power law model right so they have threshold behavior that's what power law is threshold behavior means they will behave in different regimes differently okay so now they are also emergent power law means there are different you know drivers here so different combination of these drivers will give you different results okay because you know carbon dioxide is not just a product of light okay it is light temperature salinity and other processes but these are the major drivers it is the outcome of these drivers scaling together so there would be interactive terms okay so you know sometimes if you run this model with different combination you might be surprised so don't be surprised okay because it's not just light you are you have a higher light you should get higher uh, carbon dioxide not really if you have lower temperature you will not get that if you have high salinity you will not get that you will get lower carbon dioxide uptake we have found in our data as you can see that you know there is a strong relationship between uh, carbon dioxide and salinity uh, when you go to emergent power law okay so all right so i just want to remind you a few uh, about more, a few assumptions in the model our assumption is that coastal salt marshes are productive mainly during the extended growing season okay if there is a system where it is productive year round like florida okay that will be different okay there we will we'll have assume january to october uh, december 31st all the year okay but in new england this is the our assumption and but the model is not limited to this we can expand it as as data are available okay so the model is directly applicable to the coastal salt marshes along the mid atlantic coast of usa that's our assumption uh, you know based on the 26 sites that we have tested uh, there may be exceptions and if there are please let me know and the net atmospheric carbon removal we call it we coined this new term nscr presents the carbon removed from the atmosphere by coastal wetlands net nscr equal to carbon dioxide sequestration flux minus carbon dioxide uh, and methane emission flux so you know it's a little bit confusing but we will revise it basically whatever is the net uptake minus carbon dioxide net emission minus carbon dioxide emission flux so i did not notice this before i am presenting it so i am going to update it uh, for future nscr is related to net ecosystem carbon balance of a wetland as follows ncb would be nscr minus lat lateral flux now these are the model inputs as you have seen these are this is basically a fancy way of doing that pr should be micromole per meter square per second soil temperature has to be in degree celsius you don't want to give a soil temperature temperature of zero because that will not give you anything okay and then soil salinity would be in parts per thousand 
okay. Then what do we predict? Predict uh, instantaneous wetland carbon dioxide and methane fluxes and then we scale it up to growing season then we compute, compute NACR using different uh, global warming uh, potential of methane. So again how to collect this data? These are handheld uh, device so that you can use to collect PAR data from your sites and you can also go to national solar radiation database that is the national database uh, to, uh, to find uh, approximate PAR for your site for the day that you want. Poor water salinity there is no such database as I know but I am hoping somebody like James Holmquist they will put data together okay for you okay. So otherwise you just this is also not an expensive device. So handheld device go and deep into the 5 centimeter or 10 centimeter into the soil and get the measurements of poor water salinity. It is that simple now. So soil temperature is easy you take a thermometer that is it okay. So this is all you need light, poor water salinity, soil temperature okay. So and how many inputs do you need? I would say at least one set of data one measurement concurrent measurement of light, soil temperature and salinity but preferably three sets the more the better but at least three sets that represents beginning, middle and end of growing season May, August, October okay. You just it is up to you the more data that you give. Number of days for which you are uh, you want to estimate NSCR that is 183 productive days in a year. That is not all correct but that is an approximation. CO2 equivalent global warming potential for methane 1 or 86 or 34 we recommend 34 okay and based on that you move forward. Now I, I give it to Muhammad okay to, to walk you through this is our contract I will stop here this is our contract okay and Tunamari knows our contract very well so if you have any question ask her I just wanted to acknowledge again these are the funding sources and these are the people who gave us data. So I see I covered all of them. So with that I, Mohammed will go to the Excel spreadsheet and walk you through and I will be sitting here to answer any question.